I've been thinking that it might be interesting to record the process of that I go through for learning a story, which I don't necessarily think of in all the steps, um, but this is how I teach it. And basically this is how I do it. So I just read yesterday, I think, a story called The Horned Women. And I um, found that on Substack, but I have read it before. So <laughs> this is a long explanation. So what I, what I want to do first is make sure that I actually remember the parts of the story. So I call that telling about. So in this story, there's a girl who is, um, she's the only one who's awake in her family. Everyone else has gone to bed. It's kind of near Samhain, Halloween, I believe. And she's working on some mending, or in this version, she's um, making a doll out of ribbons for her sister's birthday. And there's something that I don't remember that's about a warning, maybe about not opening the door. Um, but somebody knocks, and without thinking, she goes and opens the door, and it's a woman with a horn on her head. Okay, so I'm already getting a little bit more detailed than what I what I want people to do um, necessarily, but maybe this is just how it goes. Okay, so there's a woman with one horn on her head. Oh, and it's important that the girl is doing the doing some sewing because she has the thimble and the needle still in her hands when she answers the door, and this rather terrifying looking woman with the horn coming out of the center of her head. I don't know if she says something to her, but she very quickly grabs the needle, pricks the girl's finger, and catches a drop of blood in the thimble, which gives her power over the girl. So then she says, you know, go and sit down, or I don't remember what she tells her to do, so that's something I should I would want to look at in the story. And the girl has to... She, she's compelled to. It's like that. And the sense that I what I liked in reading this person's version was it really felt clear, like that visceral feeling that you sort of have when you're in a dream and you can't control what you're doing. So she goes and sits down and then there's another knock on the door. The woman with one horn tells her to go answer and because of the blood that she's got of the girl. The girl has to go do it. She opens the door and a woman with two horns coming out of her forehead is there. Um, I think that each one of the women that show up, because eventually there is a woman with 12 horns, so there's 12 women. I think each one of them pricks her finger and adds, yeah, and adds a drop of blood. Um, because the, I do remember also this image of the thimble being full or almost full. And then, so then they're all sitting around near the fire and I think they tell her to make bread for them and, um, or make, make bread. I don't remember if they tell her to do anything else. And then they put the thimble full of blood in the bread or no, they go upstairs first. They go upstairs to her sleeping family and take a drop of blood from each person. So then the whole family is under the spell. And I also really liked the feeling of, uh, however it was described, that heaviness that, uh, like I felt it right here in reading this version of being under that spell. So everybody's asleep, and then they're like really asleep, not breathing very strongly. She makes the bread. They pour the thimble full of blood in, and I can't remember. I don't think that they eat the bread, but I guess I need to check that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I don't remember this transition, but then they basically like their spell or their 
enchantment over the family is just about totally complete like it's implied or maybe she just knows once the sun comes up then that's that they give her a sieve and tell her rather cruelly and with with laughter to go um down to the um down to the river down to the pool and not come back until she's filled it with water so she's again compelled by the spell she goes down but of course the sieve doesn't carry water and so she's despairing and thinking about her family and how she's um, failed everyone because she opened the door when she shouldn't have opened the door to someone she didn't know and then and she's cr she cries into the pool um and a naiad rises up out of the pool a water spirit and i love this particular line who is crying salt tears into my fresh water um i don't know if that's the, the author of this version or if that's just totally traditional but i thought that was really lovely and um, and she's able to say what happened. And I think there's also something about how the tears give her a little bit of release so that she's able to speak. Mm, there's something there's something significant there that I'm not remembering. But there's there's something that that gives her a little bit of freedom. And I think it's the tears. I don't think it's that the naiad gives her water to drink. Okay, so I have to review that. Um, but the naiad knows about these horned women and references where they live. There might be some name of that mountain. But they've been imprisoned by the fae. And this is another thing I really like, is, is how she says something about how there's a spell that keeps them there but uh, something about how spells or magic always has gaps and every hundred years on Samhain on um, Halloween there's a gap so I really love that um, I just love that idea of gaps being built in or not built in but just like that's just the nature that's to me seems like uh, things being wild um that that that's just something about things being natural um so the naiad also tells her um it sounds like all of the all of the sort of blood magic that the horned women have been doing indicates that they they're if they're able to stay until sunrise, then they will no longer be imprisoned back on their mountain and they'll be able to just stay in her home, in her house, and her she and her family will all be their slaves because of the magical spell. Um, and she tells her what to do in order to break it. And then she also shows the girl, she says, pack um, mud around the outside of the sieve so that it will hold water. I also love that because in some other folk tales, there's that same motif of carrying water with the sieve, doing this impossible thing, and then there is actually a way to do it. So that has a very deep um, connection and, and lineage, which I think is quite magical about folk tales because those archetypes overlap and exist in many stories. So she, the girl, packs the mud around the sieve, and then, of course, it can hold water. She brings the water back because now she's she's still within the bounds of, of the magic spell. Um, but also she gains a little bit of power back and a little bit of agency and capacity because she does, she completes this thing that they don't intend for her to be able to do. Also really like that and how that's stated in this story that I read. So she comes back, but she just sneaks in. They're not aware of her. And I think the next thing she does is, I think she eats a bit of the bread first. 
which is the, what the naiad told her to do. And that gives her... One of these things gives her her power of voice back. And I can't remember when that happens. Um, she also slips upstairs. Or no. Uh, yeah, so I think when she eats the bread, she has the power of speech back again. Because she's got taken her own blood back into herself. And then she's able to, she imitates one of the horned women and she cries out something about whatever the name of the mountain where their home is, that it's burning. And um, so everyone's alarmed because maybe if it burns while they're not there, they all die or something. So I should have to look at that detail if that's important. Um, and so they all fly off and then she's able to go upstairs. She puts a little crumb from the bread in each family member's mouth. And even though they're asleep and enchanted, they, you know, just reflexively swallow it. The color comes back into their faces. They start breathing more normally. And with each, um, I think with each time she puts the bread in their mouths, which is also kind of lovely to think about um, communion in Christianity and just like the power of bread and nourishment and also that in the Christian tradition it's the body of Christ and, the, and then the wine is the blood of Christ. So interesting. So they get, they get their own powers back. They're still asleep. Um, and she becomes stronger and stronger each time. And then and she knows she has to hurry because she only has so much time probably before they, the horned women get back to their mountain, realize it's not on fire and come back. So she, um, she bolts the door or she nails the door shut. I think she nails the door shut. And she pours out the all the, all the water in the house, all the standing water. So the sieve, I don't know, bucket, what, whatever else there is. She pours out all the water into the yard or down the drain. She and she um, throws sand on the fire and turns out the lanterns. So I think those are the three things. And she just has managed to do that. And then she hears the horned women all flying back and they're outside and um, they want to come in. She doesn't let them in. So they call out to, I don't remember the order that this happens in, but they call out to the timbers and they say timbers under our power, something like that open to us. And, and the, the wood calls back in this creaking sort of voice that it can't because it's, it's um, shut with silver nails something about that you know silver is has these magical qualities also it'd be interesting if it's iron and and i bet in some versions it's iron because i know that like if you put a so you put a horseshoe over your door put something iron and the fae or the supernatural can't enter so that'd be something to research in other versions um, so they can't, the timbers can't open to them. Um, and so then they call out water, uh, flood the house or water under our command, flood the house. And, and the water all calls from out in the yard. Uh, we've been poured out and we can't, I don't know, we can't do it. We can't flood. And so then they call out fire, burn the house down. Um, and the fire says something like sand I, I don't know the fire is out so I don't remember exactly what the fire says um and then dawn is getting really close and um and they have to get back to their home on the mountain where they'll be imprisoned for another hundred years because if they're out when the sun comes up they burst they something like that maybe maybe it's like with trolls they turn to stone and burst so they leave and 
and the girl knows that she's safe, they're, they're safe for another hundred years, her family wakes up, and she apologizes to them, but they're really thankful. And I think there's something in the story about giving something to the naiad or bringing something down to the pool or down to the stream. And that's, that's it. That's the story of the 12 horned women. That's my telling about. So, um, as I, it's interesting to talk through it like that, because as I was talking through, there were parts that I didn't, I didn't even remember that those things were coming up until I, you know, the story kind of led me through it. Um, and as you heard, there were some parts that, um, I just want to go back read that story or if I was learning this from an oral version or from a person directly then I I would ask those questions or I'd listen to it again um yeah because those and I would say I know enough that I could I could if there was no way for me to track this story down I could just make up I could I could make my own creative choices and fill in what I'm not totally sure about. Hmm. Uh, so I'll, I'll put in the notes who I, whose version this was that I read. Paul, someone, I think. So uh, if you have questions or thoughts, um, let me know. When I, when I do the telling about, I, I'm, pretty likely to do it in present tense, but when I tell stories, when I'm really crafting a story, then I tell it in past tense because it has more of a timeless feel. But this is kind of like the same way we naturally tell about a thing that happened to us. Like, oh, so I'm in the Boundary Waters and I hear this rustling in the trees and I look up and see a moose. Thanks for watching.